Today on the Last Wire podcast, we'll be discussing the radio systems found on the Titanic and how it shaped the future of emergency communications. Join me in welcoming VE1FA, Fred Archibald. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, John. When people compare ham radio to the social network and being the very first social network, and I have to draw parallels between Marconi and Zackenberg and Facebook, he had a lot of control and influence when he looked back to 1912. Is there a comparison here to the two people and the roles that they played in in their social networks? Uh, I think there was. This was one thing was probably a bit different, and that is that uh, quite a number of uh, technically inclined people uh, very quickly appreciated the value of radio, especially for marine communication, ship to shore and ship to ship. So Marconi had quite a lot of competition uh, from, say, 1900 through, he, well, he still had, but by 1912, the time of the Titanic, uh, he essentially ran the Marconi, Marconi Britain or Marconi England. And uh, he, was, he was the big frog in the pond at that point. When you look at the Marconi room that was featured in the Titanic, it very much today we refer to the ship's deck as being radio rooms, but he very much, it was his people, his role, his uh, influence on uh, these systems and the, these companies he had leased out. That, that's right. That uh, all, all the British ships had a call sign like MGY or MCC, or, and the M was Marconi. And essentially he... Uh, uh, he loaned the ship the radio equipment, and he uh, his employees were the radio operators. So, for instance, the, the two operators on the Titanic, their hats from a distance looked pretty much like the officers' hats because they were considered officers. But when you got closer, you realized in the middle of their hat there was an M, a little braided M, and uh, this said, we're Marconi employees. And uh, in fact, when you look at the operation of the radio room on the Marconi, uh, you realize that it was actually set up not necessarily to send emergency messages, but to cater to uh, passenger traffic. And they sent over 400 passenger messages in the days that between departing Britain and when the ship sank. And uh, it, that itself had an effect on the accident, because at the time of the catastrophe, the striking of uh, the iceberg, uh, punching a hole in the, in the bow, um, they were exhausted because they'd been up sending these hundreds of messages. And uh, actually the day before, there'd been a failure in the transmitter and they spent were up all night to find the, the wire which had shorted the ground, a 14 kilovolt wire shorted the ground. And it was actually inside a transformer case. So it wasn't like just sparking against the wall. It was spark. They had to disassemble this transformer in the middle of the night and try to, and they did, and they got it working. When you think back to this technology, can you walk us through uh, right from the key through the system and up to the antenna? What was found in that radio room? Okay, let me just first, uh, as, as an overall image, uh, I, I think of that time as is the age of dinosaurs for radio. And what I mean is that there's three types of radio. Uh, there was the arc, the spark, and the alternator. Now, all three are completely obsolete today. They had a, had a great problem. And that was that there were no amplifiers in radio. So there was no way, if you got a tiny weak signal received on your antenna, there was no way you could make it louder. In the same way, when you transmitted uh, and you were heard, what was in the earphones of the receiver was only the energy which was generated in the transmitter. Today, of course, our receivers will have half a dozen amplifiers to take that tiny signal and bring it up to a comfortable level. What this meant was that the early arcs, sparks, and uh, uh, alternators had to uh, be very high power. There was, uh, at, in the time of World War I, there were megawatt arc, arc stations, for instance, million watts. Uh, and you needed that to go any distance. Uh, so these were, uh, the people then were just as smart as today. So these three types of radio, arc, spark, and alternator, uh, became very sophisticated. And the radio on the Titanic was a very sophisticated device, which took me quite a while, quite a while to figure it out once I, I got the schematics and the descriptions. Today, of course, uh, a fellow by the name of Lee DeForest came up with the, the three-element tube, the uh, triode. And uh, in 1906, it wasn't really appreciated and exploited till about uh, 1917 or 18. 
And so today, everything is based on amplifiers. You can even think there's th three ages. There's the old mechanical non-amplifier transmitters, including the uh, Titanics. There's amplified, which is up through today. And now we're slowly shifting into this uh, software-defined digital radio. So there's a, a third age of radio starting now. So the rotary spark that the Marconi uh, uh, developed, the five kilowatt that was on the Titanic, uh, was actually a very sophisticated design. Engineers had been working on it and thinking about it, and they did the best they could with the uh, physics that they had, the physics that they understood. So everything to do with the reception and transmission has no amplifiers in it. And uh, so there'd been, uh, the spark is just that uh, today we call it interference. If, if uh, you hear ignition sparks from a vehicle in your radio, well, that, that, that was the basis of the transmission back then. So for instance, the Titanic, uh, you had a motor generator set. So the Titanic ran on 100 volts DC, uh, uh, plus and minus. The, the deck, the hull of the Titanic was zero, and it had a plus 100 volts DC and minus 100 volts from the generators down in the, in the engine room. Uh, and there was many different generators and, and uh, everything. One of the things that the Titanic was the state of the art. So it had electric elevators and it had electric stoves and it had electric motors and pumps everywhere and had thousands of electric lights. And uh, what they did it was quite clever for the, the, the uh, even electric elevators. They uh, would take uh, from the plus to the minus to get 200 volts. So you ran your heavier stuff over 200. The lighter stuff, you could just run on the 100 to the deck, for instance. And that's what uh, the 5 kilowatt, it, it used 60 amperes uh, of 100 volt DC. And this ran a big motor, which spun up a uh, generator. And it also spun up a rotary disc. It's a little difficult without seeing what this thing looks like. But uh, what they called MG sets, motor generator sets, were widely used in early radio. As a matter of fact, in World War II, almost all the aircraft radios had little, they called them dynamotors, a tiny motor generator set, which spun the 28 volts from the airplane cir uh, circuitry up to 250 or 500 volts to run the radios. But in addition, in the spark sets, there was uh, a rotary spark gap. It was a spinning disc with big studs on it. And there was a step-up transformer. And when two studs aligned as the disc spun around, uh, you'd get a 14 kilovolt bolt of electricity going across. Um, if this thing was exposed, you could hear it a kilometer away. It would just it would make a roar. It basically it looked like lightning. Uh, of course, they uh, they put it in, and that's why they called it the silent room, correct? Off to the exactly. side. Exactly, it, it, the silent room held this big motor generator and uh, a lot of the capacitors, and actually it, it held a tuned circuit that uh, the radio was uh, for the frequency of the radio. And uh, this was, uh, it was all steel work, of course, in the ship, but this room was lined with heavy wood and this cut down the sound considerably. Uh, not completely. And the officers, which had uh, sleeping quarters right next to it, I think probably didn't enjoy it very much. Uh, and the, the lightning only jumped <laughs> when your key went down. And, uh, and uh, anyway, it was, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult. I, I can't get into the, design without a diagram, really. It's what's called a synchronous rotary spark. And it was a way to get uh, make sure that only on the peaks of the AC that came out of the motor generator set did you get the lightning generated. And uh, it used a key, which any Morse code operator would recognize today. What made this system more advanced than systems that had previously been uh, used and utilized? What made this unique? Was it just a better quality instrument? Uh, no, it was a, a progressive progression of thought. It's just think about the way, let's say, a television has developed. You know, developed TV started in the 30s, and here we are in the 2020s. It's a very different thing by, you know, progressive development, and and that's where this. Uh, I should say that all of these spark machines were outlawed in the early 1920s, and and they really reached their peak at about where the Titanic was in, in 12, 13, 1912, 13, 14, and. The synchronous meant that they were uh, generating the sparks just when they got the maximum spark because they were on the peak of the AC cycle. You know, we had a, 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 you have a sine wave and you pick the maximum negative and maximum positive. And just at that instant, 
uh, the studs lined up. So you've got these, this, this bolt of electricity going across. And they were able to get the frequency. It's all generated mechanically. They're able to get the frequency high enough so that uh, uh, the end, actually the motor ran at uh, six, I think it was 6,200 RPM, which is pretty fast for a 1912 electric motor. And this... Very uh, fast. Yeah. So what it did was this generated the tone which you would hear on the air. And this is why it was a musical. The old ones would be 60 cycles or 120, and they were hard to... You couldn't hear the tone very well. It blended into the background noise on 500 kilohertz or 600 meters. This is this is the frequency that... that actually, it was a, it was a two-frequency radio. Uh, it was a standard... 600 kilohertz, 600 uh, meters also. In those days, they used meters. Today, we mostly use kilohertz. And anyway, so on 600 meters, 500 kilohertz, everything happened in, in the marine radio world. And uh, if you were in trouble, you just hollered there, and hopefully somebody would hear you, and, and the QRM you were shouting into would, would part, and you'd be able to be heard. How effective was the range of this radio? Well, Marconi, we, we tend to think that Distances increase at night in shortwave, but they also increase in longwave because, of course, 500 kilohertz, 600 meters is longwave. And uh, they increase greatly. So Marconi, uh, for the daytime, they guaranteed a range of 250 miles. But in use, and the uh, Titanic transmitter was in use, heavily in use for the few days that it, it lived, uh, they got a reliable 400 miles. Now, at night, when they were doing their first trials off Northern Ireland, it was, uh, you probably know that the Titanic and its sister ship, Olympic, were built in Belfast, great shipworks in Belfast. And so they went out for their sea trials just a few days before they left. And uh, uh, the operators, I should say the operators, uh, Jack Phillips uh, was was the, the lead operator, and, and uh, they didn't just operate the thing, they installed it. Uh, Marconi sent the equipment. They installed it in the, the two rooms they were given, and then they set it up. They adjusted it. They got it running, and they were constantly trying to communicate with uh, land stations and ships as they went down the coast towards Southampton. Uh, what they found was that at night, uh, it opens up a lot. Marconi didn't guarantee any given distance at night, and probably not because uh, it's like uh, operating shortwave today. On a given night, you might get great distance another night where the propagation is a little different. It wouldn't be the same. Anyway, they got the, they contacted Tenerife and the Canary Islands, which was uh, 1,900 miles. And they contacted Port Said on the Suez Canal, which is 2,600 miles away. So uh, with good prop at night, uh, they couldn't quite get transatlantic, but they could get, they could get a long way. I should say that the operators in those days uh, this wasn't a trivial device to operate. There wasn't just an on switch and a tune, tune knob. It was, it was covered with little controls and adjustments, which constantly needed seeing too. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, the, uh, because of these old spark transmitters, the slang among sailors for these, the, the operators was sparks. And that lasted long after the, the spark transmitters went away. If you were working on comms in the Second World War, you were sparks. You mentioned the actual uh, frequency they were working in. What was it a range of frequency? Like how wide of a signal were they sending out compared to today? We can pretty much tune right to a, uh, to a frequency. Was it a fairly wide spectrum? Yes, very wide. And there was really very little they could do about that. They knew uh, initially Marconi didn't even understand. No one understood selectivity, but uh, he... Uh, he hired a, a, an electrical engineer in 1906, a, a, a fresh graduate from I don't know what school, but anyway, smart young guy. And he understood selectivity and you could get it. And he built what was called the Marconi triple tuner, which was the best receiver tuner from when it came out in 1907 till uh, 1920 when sparks started to go away. But the problem was it was a trade-off because you have no amplifiers, the narrower the bandwidth, the weaker the signal gets and the less you have to work with. And there's no way to amplify it. So uh, if you took the, what he did was he made a very efficient tuner. So there was almost no signal loss in the tuner, but uh, you couldn't make it too narrow or there'd be too, it would be too weak to hear. 
And uh, the next, the, the other challenge was the detector. You, the, really the, the, most, the most important part in a receiver is the detector, which uh, cuts off half the signal because when the si signal is symmetric, you don't hear it. It's going negative as it's going positive and you, the result is zero. But, so you need something which uh, rectifies the signal, only allows it to go one way, positive or negative. And uh, they, uh, uh, there was actually, there were two vacuum tubes on the uh, Titanic. And this was for, uh, there was a, uh, a British inventor called Fleming. And he uh, actually, he took the idea of Thomas Edison, who discovered that uh, uh, a little plate put in with a filament in, in a light bulb would uh, uh, develop some current when the filament was on. And Fleming took this and appreciated that it was one, in one direction and he used that, but it wasn't as good as what the, what the opera is called the Maggie. And the Maggie was the magnetic detector, which is a little bit like a wire tape recorder. And I probably don't want to go into the, the physics of how it works. It was uh, invented by a guy named Ernest Rutherford, who got the Nobel prize in physics. He worked on radiation and, uh, Actually, he was a professor at McGill, where my old alma mater. Anyway, he developed this thing, and it was basically a, a soft iron wire moving through some magnetic heads, uh, plus a little transducer for the signal off the antenna. And, and it, it moved like a think of a tape recorder, or a real close analogy is in World War II, they had what they call wire recorders, big spool of wire, and it would wind its way through this thing, and they could, they could tape voices and so forth. Anyway, this was the detector. Uh, and uh, enormous antenna. The Titanic had 2,560 feet of wire in the air as its antenna, and it was four enormous T's. Uh, it was big. Well, the, the, it, uh, the ship was 880 feet long, so they put up 290-foot masts, 450 feet apart, and it had four great T's. Four down, down links, which were 90 feet long to the top deck, which is where the radio station was. And then uh, each of the, uh, the tops of the T's was 450 feet long. They called it the twin T antenna. And uh, so, it, so you can't imagine a better antenna for picking up a lot of signal. You're sitting in the middle of a salt ocean. The ship is uh, all steel, makes the perfect ground. There's nobody else around doing anything electronic. And you've got this this huge. So actually, uh, if a ship close to you transmitted, it was quite brutal in the headphones. The, the headphones are the one thing that haven't changed. They're well, they don't look like the ones I have here. But if you've seen these big old earmuff types from the early days, that's what they had. They called them the telephones, but they're, they're they were just like today's. And and that's fortunately, the human ear with uh, a proper uh, headphone doesn't take a lot of power. So, uh, to have an intelligible, readable signal. And that sort of saved the thing. But uh, it was sheer size of the antennas. And uh, so the, the system worked. In, in the case of the disaster, the uh, uh, 28 ships heard the Titanic and uh, in, they communicated with 10 as well as four uh, shore stations. They were, of course, much closer to North America than they were to Britain. So there were no shore stations in Britain heard them, but Cape Race is the famous one. And there was Sias Consett down on Nantucket Island. And there was a, a New York station. And there was, I forget, one other. But uh, so uh, the radio worked very well. And the operators did an excellent job. They're, they're, well, they're, it was pretty tragic towards the end. But they, they literally, uh, Jack Phillips, the, the, the chief operator, he, he literally didn't leave until the water was washing around his feet. And uh, he probably would have continued, except that at that point, the generators had flooded out in the hold. And so there was, there's no power. When the, I should mention one interesting thing is that if you see uh, uh, James Cameron's Titanic, and I suppose everybody's seen it, but it was 1998. Uh, he did a beautiful job on the radio room. Uh, it's very close to the radio room in the Olympic uh, nobody knew at that time that the two operators had set up the Titanic's radio room differently, that the wall that separated the operating room from the silent room, this is the room that uh, was heavily lined with wood because it had the uh, motor generator set and, and the, the rotary spark gap, which made a tremendous amount of noise. And uh, so they were isolated. But a lot of the equipment that was in these uh, 
silent room on the uh, 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 what you call it, uh, Titanic was in the operators room on the Olympic. So uh, if you see the movie and you pay attention to the radio room, it, it's not quite right. All the same equipment was there. They both had the same uh, hardware, but it was set up differently. And that was also because uh, in both in both cases, it was uh, on the top deck just behind the bridge, uh, actually a couple of rooms back from the bridge. But um, uh, in one case on the Olympic, it was on one side. So they had windows. And in the Titanic, it was in the middle of the top deck with, with rooms on both sides. So that just affected the, the setup a little bit more. It also was very inconvenient that they had one of those pneumatic tube systems, which you may have seen in old hardware stores, old stores that was used in the late 1800s, early 1900s, where uh, you go to, you buy something and you, and you go to pay for it. And the money goes into a little tube, a little cylinder. And the fellow, the fellow opens a, a little hatch and he pushes it in, you hear a boom sound and, and air pressure drives it up to the uh, accountant's room up where somewhere else in the building. And he, he takes your money and puts in the change, puts in your receipt and boom, it comes back. That's how the Titanic's passengers got to send the radio message. They went to the chief purser and he sent it up by pneumatic tube to the radio room. The fact that there was no way to communicate directly between the radio room and the bridge was, was uh, a, a real omission because um, Captain Smith in the disaster had to run back and forth uh, and it was dark and it was mass confusion and, and the people were trying to get boats down and blocking the, the top deck with boats. and. Uh, Smith had to work his way through that to, to tell them when to start sending. Uh, well, I actually started with the first emergency uh, sign, which was CQD, Charlie Queen Delta. And uh, they sent that a number of times. And, and Smith, uh, actually Smith hung his head in the door. He came down first and he said, uh, be ready, because he needed to then make his inspection below deck to, to decide. And when he saw that more than five compartments were filling with water. He knew that that was the death knell, that the, the Titanic was surely sinking. So he came back up and uh, told uh, uh, told Jack to uh, send uh, the message. And he said, what are you going to send? And, and he said, well, CQD. And uh, the uh, other uh, other operator, geez, now I've forgotten. Oh, Harold Bride. Kind of, he, he kind of joked. He said, well, why don't you send the new one? Why don't you send SOS? You know, it might be your last chance. And oh, oh, oh they're all laughing. And of course, both Captain Smith and Jack Phillips perished, and then only Harold Bride survived. So they sent CQD and then SOS alternately. Now we look at CQD and SOS, and kind of the Morse code was still being defined by international law. There was Marconi's rules, but there also was international rules. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction? Yes. Uh, the uh, international rules are something called the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. And uh, it was formed in the 1860s. And if you think of it, you might say 1860s. There wasn't any radio then. What what did the ITU uh, regulate? Well, what it regulated was uh, uh, code, uh, Morse code uh, or international code being used in Europe, because you think Europe, it's uh, about 40 different countries, all speaking different languages. And the railways, of course, travel between the countries. So they needed to come up with a standard, standard protocols and standard abbreviations for that. And when radio came along, they came up with a, uh, a set that, that fit radio. But you're, you're quite right that Marconi had its own procedures through all this. And there's all sorts of things that, and, and especially uh, Jack Phillips, he was, he was still a pretty young guy. He was only 25. But in fact, he'd been operating for 10 years. He started when he was 15. So he, he, he knew the system very well. Uh, actually, the first part, uh, there really wasn't any radio on ships to operate. So he, he worked for the on the railways. He worked for the British post office from the time he was 15 till he was uh, about 19 or 20. I forget that name. And then he started on, on, on ships. So he was quite experienced. Uh, and there's a lot of little things about the operating procedure uh, that gave problems. Uh, there was, for instance, uh, at one point, very close, there was a ship only 11 miles away, the Californian. And its, its operator uh, tried to get hold of uh, 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 the Titanic. And uh, so he, he prefaced his message with SOM. And, uh, and it said that, uh, 
the, the ocean is filled with ice uh, where the Californian has come to rest because it's, it's too dangerous to proceed. Well, uh, Phillips had been up for uh, about 36 hours. He was up all night repairing the defective wire and he'd been doing messages all the previous day. And this was late at night on the 14th and he'd been running messages like mad for the passengers. Uh, you know, make sure Aunt Tilly takes her pills and so forth back to, to uh, Britain or forward to North America. And so he was exhausted. And the, the, the protocols that they had were, for instance, if it said MSG, first letters to come, that would be a message for the captain. This must go to the captain immediately. When uh, Cyril Evans on the California sent the message, he started with SOM, which is say old man. And this is just between operators, casual. Well, well, Jack didn't have any time to worry about that. He just, he stuck it under his uh, left elbow. He's sending with, sending Morris with his right hand. He sticks the message under his elbow. And he gets a second one from another ship called the Masaba. Same thing. Uh, and this one didn't have either MSG or uh, SOM. Uh, and so if it didn't have, it, if it didn't have MSG, it, he put them aside because he was just trying to clear all the stuff he had to send. And so the, the captain, Captain Smith of the, the Titanic, never got either of those messages to said with the, the field was full. The other thing was that, uh, anyway, there's lots of little protocols, like the faster ship always had pri uh, priority sending messages in the Marconi system, because a faster ship was at sea less time, and there was less time to make money sending messages for passengers. So that ship got priority, and the slower ship was, that was after. And so there was a, a famous thing where, uh, in the newspaper, it said that uh, uh, Jack had uh, uh, said shut up to the operator from the Californian. But what he did, he sent a set of da da dit da da dit da da dit. He sent a set of D's, which was just uh, that was a pro that was the abbreviation for uh, I'm the faster ship and I need to get these messages through. And and uh, but the uh, uh, the name Cyril Evans on the Californian was offended by it. well he'd been up. He was the only operator on the California, and he'd been up for 18 hours operating, and he was beat. So he said, that, that's it, I'm going to bed, and which he did. And uh, one of the great tragedies is that later the Californian uh, could see a ship uh, lit 11 miles away, and that was the uh, Titanic sinking. And if, if they had, uh, uh, and the engines were idling, they, they could have been there in time before the, Calif the Titanic sank and, and could have rescued probably a very large proportion of those 1,500 people that died. But the crew called Captain Lord of the Californian, and he came up and he looked and he said, that's not the right shape for the, uh, the Titanic. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and then the Titanic sent rockets up and he said, well, you know, it's probably a, a, a pleasure ship and they're just, they're, they're putting on a show for the passengers. So he ignored the rockets, he ignored the ship that was sitting there. And uh, his radio op had gone to bed and Another thing he could have done was he could have just said, well, get the radio op up and see if there's anything going on over there that we should be concerned about. But he didn't. So uh, the, the Titanic died within full sight of the Californian resting. Th th there's a number of those tragic things. and A whole bunch of unfortunate events all happened at once. That's right. As a matter of fact, the Titanic being damaged was a very close thing. That uh, For what it was, which was a, an 880-foot ship, a huge ship, uh, in the sea trials, Captain Smith had uh, described it as a, a wonderful turning ship. It'll turn on a sixpence, he said. And uh, for an 880-foot ship, it was pretty good. But when the, the, they had two expert lookouts in the, in, on the, uh, the front uh, mast, and this was also the radio mast, but the, the, these guys, the mast was hollow at the bottom. They could go up inside, and they were about uh, 60 feet above the deck. And they, uh, it worked out that the ship was going... It was going very fast because the uh, Bruce uh, Inglis, Inglis was his name, yeah, the owner of the Titanic, uh, had dinner with the captain and, and he, the day before. And he asked the captain, well, how are we doing? And the captain said, we're exactly on schedule. We'll uh, almost certainly reach New York on the exact day we expect. And uh, Bruce uh, said, uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to make a bigger splash. Could we get there a day earlier? And uh, he persuaded the captain, against the captain's better judgment, to run uh, at high speed at night. And that's what they were doing. So when the, the, the lookouts first saw the uh, ice, it was uh, uh, less than two minutes before they struck it. 
So they instantly picked up their little telephone in the crow's nest and they called the bridge and the bridge uh, uh, shut the engines down and spun the wheel hard over. And so actually if they'd done nothing, they would have hit the iceberg head on and the, and the Titanic quite likely would have survived because it wouldn't have put the long slash down the side. They would have destroyed the bow and probably uh, broached two, two or possibly three uh, uh, segments of the ship, but not five, which is what killed it. Anyway, it just couldn't turn fast enough. The, 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 the people on the bridge and the, the lookouts did exactly what they should have done, but it was just, there was, at that speed, there just was no time to turn a huge ship like that. We reviewed the Titanic disaster and look back on the past and start looking at what came of radio communications, the importance. And obviously it was important of the day, but did it become more important? Yes. What? Well, the uh, for once, bureaucracy really seemed to do quite a good job. Well, this was a real shocker. This was the unsinkable Titanic. And, and 1,500 of the 2,200 people were killed uh, really unnecessarily. Uh, most of them, of course, died of exposure in the water. Uh, as a ma- oh, there's, there's a whole other sad story about the operators, radio operators. But uh, anyway, so the uh, ITU, International Telecommunications Union, that uh, we mentioned earlier, was due to meet sometime in 2012 uh, in the summer. But they put that off because... The uh, first there was the board of inquiry in the United States over the Titanic, and then there was a board of inquiry in Britain over the Titanic because they both obviously were were involved. And uh, what the outcome was a complete new set of radio operating procedures and rules for ships at sea and radio. And it, it, this is the ITU uh, rules of 1912, which we're still basing our. It, it brought in our modern system of call signs for radio stations. It brought in a whole set of regulations about, uh, for instance, most ships, at least the smaller ones, only had one operator. That There had to be 24-hour monitoring of uh, 500 kilohertz, which became the emergency frequency. Um, radios had to meet a certain standard and have a certain level of uh, range, and depending on the ship they were on and so forth. And uh, there was a whole series of things which came, came out of this. Uh, the uh, yeah yeah the, basically you had to have at least two uh, operators on in 24 hour monitoring. For instance, on the Californian, if there had been two operators in 24 hour monitoring, uh, most or all of the people on the Titanic would have been rescued. And they were they were very close. It's interesting because of course people like uh, uh, the captain of the uh, Californian uh, had to testify, and uh, he was on the margin of. Of uh, it, it's the, the worst crime at sea is to fail to respond to another ship in distress. And uh, anyway, he wasn't charged in the end, but uh, in the, the words of the New York Times, his career was blighted, and he never got a good command after after that. But uh, so uh, a new set of protocols and call signs were developed. Uh, frequency bands were assigned. In the in that ITU ruling, there's the famous line that all radio hams know that uh, radio amateurs are to be given uh, 1,500 meters and down. Uh, excuse me, 1,500 uh, kilocy- kilocycles, as they would have said, and down, which meant that every frequency above 1,500 kilocycles, which is in the AM broadcast band, were to be given to amateurs. And... Uh, Basically, we were given the whole spectrum other than this low frequency. And of course, that changed with time. But uh, people just, it was just, just way too much good stuff. And, and amateurs actually discovered how wonderful short wave was. You could have a few watts and you could push them two, three thousand, four thousand miles. So uh, uh, all that was laid down. And, and, and as many, and there was the iceberg patrols were set up and, and a, a series of things were done so that. Uh, it's now said, and I'm, I'm sure it's true, that far more than the 1,500 people that died on the Titanic were saved by the new radio regulations. And there's even, uh, they, they weren't, weren't developed at the time of the ITU, but shortly thereafter, auto alarms were developed. And this was a, a little dedicated radio uh, on uh, 500 kilohertz, 600 meters. It did nothing but listen for these emergency calls. Uh, matter of fact, all the rescue planes in World War II would have these. And there was uh, uh, two periods of radio silence. I don't know if you've ever seen a radio room clock. 
but it'll have it'll be a conventional clock, but there'll be two ridge, uh, wedges of red from uh, 13 to 18 minutes past the hour and from 45 to 48 minutes past the hour. And these two wedges, three minutes each, uh, are when if you're uh, you cannot transmit on 500 kilohertz unless you're in distress. And uh, you, uh, so every operator had to listen in those periods. And so it was either, you just had a separate radio, so you didn't have to you know, change the settings on your, on your major radio. And uh, what they eventually came up with is a little system where the radio also had dashes around the edge. So you sent four four second dashes with one second gaps in between. And this would trigger a simple little electromechanical thing. So lights would flash and bells would go off in the receiver. So even if uh, uh, no one was in attendance, there'd be all this racket and you'd run down and you'd, you'd uh, listen in and you'd find out what the problem was. These were used in rescue planes in World War II. Uh, the, they had these little lifeboat transmitters that you'd hand crank called, called the, uh, the May West. And uh, as you cranked, you automatically sent out the signal, which triggered the auto alarm. So you could hear the long dashes on a regular radio, or if you were away from the radio, the, the, the lights and the bells would go off and you'd run over and, and uh, you'd get the message. It would be fair to say at that time frame, it was very much the Wild West of amateur radio and the Wild West of wireless communication that we're just getting to develop and understand how and appreciate how to use it. Yeah, very, very much so. Uh, there's a, a, a famous uh, pair of uh, radio amateurs uh, at Harvard University. And, and uh, the U.S. Senate, after the fir First World War, as a matter of fact, wanted to get rid of amateur radio altogether, leave it for the companies and the, the military and the government and so forth. And uh, they, they went and testified. And at that time, there was... Uh, it's still a, a proud tradition in, in amateur radio that the hams will respond and do anything they can to assist in uh, in emergencies, uh, hurricanes and floods and fires and so forth. And uh, their help was even more needed back in the early days because uh, radios weren't nearly so common and telephone systems tend to be just very local things and one wire down would incapacitate the system. So uh, eventually these two uh, and supposedly their initials were H-A-M together. The, and uh, so this is where ham came from. That's that's apocryphal. Who knows if it's really true. But anyway, uh, amateurs had to fight to get back on the air after the First World War. And uh, before that, it was very much the Wild West. And, and so it could be very annoying that they'd be on top of there is time signals for determining your longitude and other things and just simply where you were. Uh, the, the, the naval air station down in somewhere in Virginia, I think, and hams would be right on top of that. And anyway, yeah, no, but you didn't need a license. You just got on and, and you know, put out as much power as you could. And, but uh, uh, anyway, the ITU, which is still in force and still meets regularly and changes things that need to be changed or upgraded, uh, uh, basically got some got some good out of the, the tragedy of the, the Titanic going down. Yeah, certainly an unfortunate event, but historic moment for amateur radio, for emergency communications, and one that uh, I think uh, being in Halifax and being in Nova Scotia, it's certainly very close to our heart because it, a lot of the people that responded to the disaster were connected to the Atlantic provinces. Yes, well, there was a ship, senior moment, whose name I forget, that went out just a few days after. Uh, and picked up all sorts of floating things there. No survivors at that point, of course, because the water was very, very cold. But It's amazing that they were able to survive with such cold temperatures. Oh, it was. Yeah. Actually, there's quite an interesting article. Uh, Harold Bride was the assistant, and he, uh, uh, on the 6th of April, uh, she went, uh, 16th, 16th or 17th, anyway, it went down on early morning of the 15th. Uh, in New York, uh, uh, Guillermo Marconi and Harold Bride sat down for an interview with a reporter from the New York Times, and and uh, you can look that up. And it, it's 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 his description of the whole event. Now you have to take what Bride said with one grain of salt, and that is that Marconi was his ultimate boss, and uh, of course Marconi didn't want to come out of this looking bad. So uh, several things happened which he told people years later, which he did not tell to his boss or to the New York Times. But nonetheless, it's a very interesting piece to read about exactly what happened. 
for instance, one of the things he didn't tell him about was that uh, he was running around, he was adjusting the transmitter. It, it needed constant adjustment because the water was getting into one generator and then another. And so the voltages were changing. And so we had to make all these adjustments. And uh, so he, he uh, then ran around and Jack wouldn't get up from his seat where he was operating. Uh, so uh, uh, Harold found him a life jacket. He kind of put it on him. Uh, and uh, he went off to work on the uh, silent room again. He came out and there's a stoker uh, who was had no life jacket and he was pulling uh, Jack Phillips off so he could use it. And uh, uh, Bride tried to pull this big sturdy guy off off Phillips and couldn't. So he grabbed a big wrench and whacked him across the head with it. And he went down in a, in a, a welter of blood. And uh, uh, he didn't tell that to Marconi of the New York Times. Anyway, uh, it's interesting because when they, uh, the deep diving submersible first looked into what the remains of the silent room, sadly enough, right now, people are trying to pull up what remains of the radio equipment to put on display in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, it's been granted by a, a judge. It went, it went to a little court hearing. Uh, but they're not going to get that much because the, the operating room, which had the receiver and a lot of the controls and so forth in it, uh, the back wall blew out at some point and all the equipment went cascading down actually the grand staircase if you've seen the movie there cascading down the grand staircase to some place deep in the deep in the ship but a lot of the silent room is still there but it's degenerated degraded over the years but what you can see is that uh, uh, phillips was elastically and clearly he reached in and he pulled the main power the big big old-fashioned knife switches with big gauges over them. And he pulled, opened the main power switch. Now, there's no reason in the world why this would make any difference to anything because the ship was sinking and there was no power. But that was procedure. And you went by procedure. He followed procedure right till the end, which is impressive. Yes. Oh, very much. And, and uh, well, he was, again, he'd been doing this for 10 years and he was, he was, it, it wasn't like operating a modern radio with an on switch and a, a couple of reliable controls that there was a lot of adjustments in this thing. I know there's so much more to talk about, especially with uh, looking at the radio, the equipment, and it's a presentation that you've done in the past that's taken hours, and we've tried to crunch it down to a few minutes, so I really appreciate you taking the time to highlight emergency communications that happened on the Titanic. I think it, it's a story that's timeless. It is. Uh, it's Well, I mean, it, it's got uh, uh, all the romance to it. I know I've, I've heard uh, Cameron's movie described as Romeo and Juliet with wet feet. And in the end, it, it, it renewed and refreshed the regulations which covered radio, and uh, an awful lot of ships didn't sink, or if they did go down, their people were rescued because of radio. And uh, here in Nova Scotia, for instance, uh, afterwards, actually, I think it was late teens, early 20s, uh, they started putting in uh, uh, radio beacons uh, uh, in the LF region, 305 kilohertz, 340, 360, uh, on each lighthouse around Nova Scotia. And this system, if you look at the number of shipwrecks in Nova Scotia before that, uh, of course, the, sh the coast is, is uh, very rocky. There's lots of fog. And, and ships would try to keep a safe uh, uh, distance from what they call the lee shore because especially with sail, they'd be blown on the lee shore onto the rocks and, and hundreds and hundreds of ships, big and small, were destroyed. Once the radio beacons went in, the, uh, these little boats, fishing boats and, and uh, small packet boats and so forth, would all have uh, a, a round loop on the top of the, uh, the cabin. And this would be for a little radio, very simple, not very expensive, uh, and they could get a bearing. And in each uh, of these sent each of these sent slow morse so you could know which it was and uh, St. Paul Island was SPI for instance and uh, each each one would have this and you could triangulate so here's here's uh, uh, Halifax and here's Sydney and you you draw the lines on your chart and you know just where you are and when that came in there was a dramatic decrease in the number of ships that were wrecked on the rocks so uh, Anyway, ra radio in the end became a tr tremendous savior of, of uh, boats and people. Well, I appreciate you coming on our show and joining us. This is the Last Wire podcast, and it, it's fantastic having someone on talk about history, the Titanic, and kind of where we're going with emergency, emergency communications. It's uh, great to have you on the show. So I really appreciate you giving us the time today. 
Well, well, thank you very much, John. I, I enjoyed it.